Hi, everybody. Welcome to the October 11th, 2019 edition of Colorado Inside Out. I'm Patty Calhoun, the editor of Westward, and I'm subbing for Dominic Dizzuti, who is still out. But there's plenty going on without him here, so we're going to start right now on Dropout Friday. We're going to get a quick take on the very quick dropouts from Crisanta Duran and Alice Madden. Fortunately, we have Marianne Goodland from Colorado Politics, Chief State, State House Reporter. What do you think about these two dropouts? It's, it's interesting. I don't think Crisanta's uh, campaign lit up the way she had hoped it would. She struggled with the fundraising. She got some big endorsements, but in the end, she couldn't raise the money to take on a really entrenched uh, incumbent in Diana DeGette. With Alice Madden, the former House Majority Leader, she has said that she dropped out because once Hickenlooper got into the race, that was sort of the end of, of, of her, her opportunity. Um, but it'll be interesting to see where these two women head in, in the future. David Copel from the Independence Institute and a DU law professor. Where do you see these two going? Um, who knows on, on that one? Perhaps nowhere ever again. But, <laughs> but they, they both had, you know, uh, Madden had a plausible rationale for running. She was a successful uh, state legislator, was part of her, uh, chosen by her colleagues to be in the leadership. It was an open seat. She wasn't the most famous candidate running, but you know why not give it a try and, and see what happens, because sometimes you win under circumstances like that. And then, as she said, Hickenlooper comes in, and now the Democratic uh, Senatorial Campaign Committee and everybody else is, is big footing to try to get everybody out. And she, I think, probably accurately realized she didn't have a path to the nomination. Uh, Duran, obviously also a very successful legislator, Speaker of the House, uh, but her campaign against get never really had any rationales. I guess I'm fresher and younger, and by the way, I'm not white. Uh, but get is a very effective leader in Congress, has been representing Denver well uh, for two decades. So to run against a, a successful incumbent, she really never came up with uh, any compelling reason for, for people to join her. John Bowman from the Brother Jeff Network. How do you see this change in the landscape? Well, I, I, I'll tell you, uh, uh, Durant, uh, Chrisanna Durant, uh, I think that was a pipe dream on her part, you know, just trying to trying to jump in. Um, in terms of Madden, um, same same kind of thing. I, you know, a couple of weeks ago when, when Hickenlooper dropped out, that next day I, I drove by his house and knocked on his door and the, the housekeeper let me in. He, oh, he's out on the back deck. He's out there, you know, with another guy. And so I walked out and... Uh, there sitting uh, with, with Hickenlooper was uh, Mike Johnston. And so I said, whoa. I was like, okay. So I walked into the middle of a, something here. And so Mike was there to, you know, to tell him I'm going to drop out in two or three days. And I think, I think that has rolled downhill to all these candidates. I mean, uh, when you have the, when you had the, fed, the federal, you know, the uh, congressional party from Washington come in and, and say, we're going to support him even before the primaries, I don't think anybody really has a chance in that race except Hickenlooper. And Natasha Gardner from 5280, Articles Editor. Whose door have you been knocking on lately? <laughs> <laughs> well, it seems like I need to knock on more doors. There are fewer doors now if there's fewer candidates in the race. I mean, it's interesting. It's getting to that point where it's one thing to say you're going to run, and it's another thing to raise the money to put together the campaign, to go through the slog that it will be to actually make it to Election Day. And I think that's what we're seeing in both of these races. You know, just for a moment, I'll, I'll take a second to notice that both of them are female candidates. Um, instead of dwelling on that, but just focus on the fact that Colorado has such a great reputation right now um, in our state house um, in, in producing really wonderful, interesting, exciting, dynamic women leaders. So I'm hoping this is not the last we hear from both of them. Well, and in slightly less breaking news, state officials have released the, de the details of the public option insurance plan created by the Colorado legislature last session. The details include price setting and, and mandating that all hospitals accept the insurance. Marianne, you've been covering this. Where do you see it going? Well, the interesting thing is that the, this has been described as a public-private partnership, but I'm also hearing it be described by the hospitals and the insurance companies as a handcuff. Uh, I see this as shaping up to be one of the big battle royales of the 2020 legislative session. The report is due from the Department of Public Health and the Division of Insurance to the lawmakers on November 15th, and then they're supposed to come up with legislation that will put this business into place. Um, it does anticipate, they do anticipate seeing insurance rates drop by seven, somewhere between seven and 18 percent, 
But the hospitals and the insurance companies are all already crying foul over this. And I, th I think it's going to be, along with families, one of the, the two biggest battles that we'll see in the next legislative session. David, any predictions on this? Well, I think Marion was exactly right to focus on the, the word partnership. And, and in a partnership, the two partners voluntarily join with each other rather than the law backed ultimately by men with guns saying, guess whose partner you have to be. Uh, the public option, as it's called, is subsidized health care and insurance for some people, you know, like we have with the Medicaid program, but now expanded in a different way. And the way that gets paid for is the government won't raise taxes or allocate sufficient funds to pay for it, so they do a impose a hidden tax, which is you make the force the hospitals to take people at rates that are really would drive the hospitals out of business if they had to take everybody at that rate. So they make up for giving a subsidy to one person by jacking up the prices even more on everybody else, nam namely everybody else who has a non-government health insurance plan. So this is a plan to drastically raise rates on non-government insurance for everyone else and the it creates a vicious cycle where people will switch to the subsidized thing, fewer people will be paying the subsidy on the other hand, and eventually you drive private insurance out of the market and we can now be on the veterinary standard where the government pays for everything and if they decide it's time for you to die and they're tired of, tired of paying for your hip replacement because you're 87 years old, uh, that's the end of you. But they'll give you your suicide pills uh, for, for free with no copay. <laughs> John. <laughs> I'm just waiting for Trump's plan to come through so we can really get some beautiful uh, health care. Uh, yeah. But I, I don't think that's coming. Uh, you know, I, I'd, I'd like to know, I haven't seen anything in the bill that talks about the hospitals, the doctors, the specialists. You, all, you have to pay for each one of those. And will they buy in? That's, that's, a, that's a big question. Uh, hospitals have good lobbies, and I would imagine going forward, so will, so will some of the specialists. Um, Will there be a price index that is linked to, to Medicare? Because that's what they're talking about at the national level. And I, I, don't, I haven't heard if that's going to be the, the, the modus operandum here, but if it is, that's a, that's a good thing. And then how much will drug prices cost? Will there be a, you know, what is, what is your uh, deductible going to be? Will there, will there have to be high deductibles to get in this plan? Um, so, I mean, these are all questions that I have, but I, you know, and I haven't, I haven't really seen any answers necessarily. But if this is going to be one of, as you predict, one of the big fights, you know, in, in the legislature over tw in 2020, nothing will be done. I'll just say that right up off the bat. And Natasha, Governor Polis and other state officials were touting how this is a drop in prices, but obviously not everyone is buying it. Yes, and anyway, it's important to point out this is a draft. The whole purpose of this is now we're going to go on a bit of a walking tour to find out what works, what doesn't, who's upset, who isn't. We'll have more conversations at this table about that. What I find interesting is this is definitely something that Polis um, campaigned on. And, and from the moment he took office, sort of from the initial speech, that state of the state, you know, and there's a joke to be made here probably about his blue sneakers, but he hit the the ground running and he has uh, continued with that so this um, this proposal here is pretty impressive to have done within a year and it'll be interesting to see how he can continue the momentum going on this particular topic with the rest of his administration knowing that there's going to be some big pushback particularly from hospitals and we will be talking about it a lot around this table over the next year but right now the hot topic involves the impeachment issue Color, color, Colorado Republicans continue to stand by their man, President Trump, while Republican leaders protested outside Congressman Jason Crow's office this week, saying he did not, he did not run on a pro-impeachment platform and that therefore this impeachment call is unacceptable. On Thursday, Senator Cory Gardner gave a very non-responsive response heard around the world regarding impeachment. He would not answer reporters' questions. And we'll just go from there. David, where do you see these two going? <laughs> well, uh, Crow was a, a major figure in this latest thing. He was one of seven uh, Democrats who wrote the letter to Speaker Pelosi saying, start doing something on this, do an open an inquiry on this Ukraine thing, which succeeded. I think it's okay that he didn't run on impeachment in 2018 because Trump hadn't done the things yet uh, for which he likely will be impeached. So I, I think it's okay to, you know, that he didn't prejudge. The, well, I don't know that what he's 
I bet he'll do something that's impeachable in 2019, so I'm for impeachment already. <laughs> I think he would, he would wait till actually the, the acts had been discovered. Uh, in, in our dystopian infotainment alternate universe, um, I think the next several months of episodes are actually going to be kind of boring because the plot line is very predictable, and I wish they would just cut. And so next week, Trump pardons Giuliani, and then he gets impeached for that. And then, then we can move to the more exciting and unknown uh, episodes in this. Uh, one of the articles of impeachment against President Nixon was his stonewalling the legitimate impeachment investigation by the U.S. House of Representatives. Um, Trump has no legal le leg to stand on with this stonewalling. The Constitution says that the House shall have the power of impeachment, and that's all it says. And I agree as a political matter that having a sleazebag like Adam Schiff running the inquiry and keeping the testimony secret from the public is a bad idea, but that doesn't mean it's unconstitutional uh, or illegal. And if Trump continues stonewalling, I think there's a strong argument that the House of Representatives, in a nonpartisan way, just to protect its own powers, including setting precedents against future precedents, presidents or others, uh, that that, in a, the stonewalling in itself, uh, would be a clearly impeachable uh, offense, as, as I think Attorney General Eric Holder should have been impeached for his stonewalling uh, about the, and cover-up of the administration scheme which sent semi-automatic rifles to, New to the Mexican drug cartels uh, so that they could be used to m murder Mexican citizens and then after being found in Mexico uh, could be used to promote uh, gun control. Uh, homicide plus cover-up is also impeachable. So let's not pretend that what Trump's doing is so different from what the previous administration did. Both deserve impeachment. John, there's a lot to unpack here. We already had the Crow protest and then Gardner, who wound up talking to, for five minutes to reporters and saying not a whole lot, but getting a lot of attention on the national news this morning. Yeah, he did. And, and, and as a matter of fact, you know, David, David talks about impeachable offenses. I mean, we can go all the way back to when Ali North was in the basement of the White House trading guns for, you know, yeah. hostages and, the home, and yeah. drugs and everything, bringing drugs into South Central and, and killing black folks around the country with the crack cocaine. I, I mean, those guys should have been impeached as well. I mean, I think every administration goes through something where they have, where they have to figure out where they're at. I mean, last night you had all the you had all the Democrats doing their town hall session, uh, but at the same time you had twenty thousand people at a Trump rally, and he I, I can't even remember one of the things that he said it, but it was just hor horrendous. I couldn't even believe he said it. But um, uh, uh, in terms of uh, Jason Crow, I think he you know he like you said he was one of the ones that got the ball rolling, and and they had to they had to make this move. In, in, a, in, a, in a timely manner because they get ready to go on vacation again and they were going to run out of time if they hadn't started this, this hearing process. Um, so I, I think in, in, terms of, uh, in terms of what uh, Cory Gardner has done and what he, you know, his comments this last week or non-comments, as you will, uh, should he stay on? Should he be reelected? I'm just saying no, no, and no. Okay, Natasha. <laughs> Corey Crow, where do we go from here? Well, let's start with Corey. Um, I think every reporter has been in that moment where you, you think you've crafted the perfect question. Yeah. It's a simple yes and no. Let's just get an answer, something that's going to illuminate an issue for our readers, our listeners, whatever your audience may be. And then the source just avoids the question. But in this case, he did it again and again and again. So if anything, it'll give some insight to people about <laughs> what a reporter's day-to-day -day life is like. But ultimately, it, it just hides the, the what the question was trying to get at, was w regardless of the impeachment queer inquiry, did he think that what had happened was incorrect? Give a yes or no on that, Cory Gardner. I'm guessing it's not the last time he's going to get asked that question. More reporters are going to come at him to try to get an actual definitive answer on that. And on the Crow um, question, uh, you, the protests outside of his office are part of a national effort. They're going to be doing this with um, other legislators as well. All of it sort of, again, obviously uh, just hides other conversations that are going on right now. You know, for instance, what probably should be headlining the news right now is what's happening in Syria, but we're spending a lot of time talking about what's happening outside of Jason Crow's offices. <laughs> And outside of wherever Gardner had been speaking. Marianne, I'm sure you followed this and wonder what's going to happen with 2020 elections, given how everyone's getting all the attention right now. I, I, Jason Crow run, won his last election by 12 points. The fact that the Republican National Committee and others have identified him as a vulnerable target, I find 
a, a little bizarre. And then you also have to look at the positions that have been taken by some of the people who are running against him. Both Steve House and Casper Stockham, the Republicans in the race, and, and who were both at that demonstration yesterday, are perfectly fine with an impeachment inquiry moving forward. However, they've both added that caveat that it should be a vote uh, by the full House on conducting an impeachment inquiry. Constitution doesn't require it. It's not in the law. Uh, so, and and the other the other thing that I thought was interesting a year ago when Jason Crow said he wasn't uh, supportive of, of impeachment, he had a caveat of his own. He said, based on what we know right now, and that was before the Mueller report came out. That was before Ukraine, and once Ukraine came out, he he did a, a 180 and and the. The letter that he and the other uh, members, the other Democrats who are all military and national security experts, came forward with it, the impeachment inquiry was announced the very next day. Well, this is not the last time we'll be talking about impeachment at this table. <laughs> but on a shorter term, we've got an election coming up in November. And the Centennial Institute, a well-known Colorado conservative group, has declared its opposition to Proposition DD, the proposition that will be on this November's ballot that would legalize sports betting and tax it to fund Colorado's water plan. The Centennial Institute says it believes that the measure will corrupt sports. Shocking. John, what do you think? Sports is already pretty corrupt. I don't know, I don't know how they can do it do any more to it. In, 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 terms, of, um, in terms of helping with the water, I mean, the, the state already has several different programs that involve a little bit of betting and gambling, and one of them is uh, Great Outdoors Colorado, which has been successful in uh, getting 49% of the tax dollars uh, from, uh, from the lottery, and, and, and they've used that very effectively to build parks and recreation uh, you know, uh, avenues of, and venues around the state. Um, what what uh, last week or two weeks ago, California passed a bill that said that college students now may sell their face, they may sell their names, they may sell their uniforms and, and numbers and things like that. They have the pay-to-play deal that they passed out there. Now, none of the other states have that. It, 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 I, Colorado hasn't mentioned that in in in, in relationship to this bill and, and DD, but the but to me the bottom line is if that comes in, that's going to change the game entirely. I mean, you already have parlays and you have different ways that people bet on professional sports now, um, but if 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 this pay to play comes to Colorado and to other states, I think everybody's going to be in a pickle. Well, and of course, DD would not make Colorado the only state to accept sports betting. Natasha, what do you think of this take? Uh, I'll echo that, yes, yeah, sports have been corrupt long, <laughs> corrupted long before this happened. Um, but uh, interestingly, as we look at this, uh, the point of, of addiction services, yes, gambling can be a very serious addiction for some people, and do we need resources and awareness about that? So I'm going to kind of find some silver lining in this discussion. I'm not sure this sort of single voice raising their hand is going to, to stop this from going forward, but it is an important discussion. Do we have resources in the state for people um, who might uh, have addiction, um, betting addiction problems? Um, and as far as, as the water issues, I mean, we know, we talk about it at the table all the time, from water to transportation to schools, there are so many things in the state that need funding. This is another creative way to come up with that funding. And of course, Marie, and you were following it in the legislature where the casino towns certainly have pushed this, but they worked very closely to come up with something that would be maybe palatable to Colorado voters, which is the water plan. Correct. Um, the water plan is in need of really major funding. When it first came out, the price tag on that was $30 billion, more than we need for transportation uh, or or some of the other uh, great things, you know, education, those kinds of things. The money that would be raised through Proposition DD is to use a really stupid water pun, a drop in the bucket. Uh, at, at the most, it might come up with maybe somewhere in the $20 million range. The state's obligation on this is supposed to be $100 million a year starting next year. This obviously isn't going to fill that bucket by any means. The other thing that I find interesting is this, this was a very bipartisan bill when it went through the legislature. Uh, John Cook was the sponsor of it in the Senate, um, and Patrick Neville had helped write it. So, and, and of course, you had lots of Democrats backing this too. 
And the Centennial Institute is not shy about showing up at the state capitol when they, there's something down there they don't like, whether it's the Civil Rights Commission, the sex ed bill that we had in this last legislative session. They, they are very happy to gin up opposition to things. They never showed up on this one at all. They didn't testify against it. They didn't lobby against it. The fact that they're now coming out three days before the ballots go out to voters to argue against this, I just find kind of curious. David, do you find it curious? Well, I found it informative to read the Colorado Sun because they had a great article by Brian Eason, which really goes through the, the economics of this and explains that the amount that's actually going to come out for, for the water plan, which we agree needs a lot more money, is, is going to be very small. And when you already have legalized gambling in a state like we do, adding another form of that often just cannibalizes gambling dollars from the already legal things. Um, if it passes, I would hope the legislature will pass something that just limits it to people betting on like you know, who's going to win or lose the game because sort of the, the next round is people get the, the gambling in their cell phones, which this would certainly allow for, is to, to push the addicts uh, for revenue, like bet on play by play. Will, you know, will the team make a first down in the next three minutes? Those kinds of things. So instead of like just losing or making one bet on one game, you can make lots of bets and lose a lot more money more quickly uh, within a single game. And then have the water keep flowing in Colorado. Yeah. <laughs> Let's get a quick take on this. Colorado Rising, an anti-fracking group, has filed a lawsuit to stop new oil and gas permitting in the state. The promised new regulations from Senate Bill Number 181 created the landmark, a landmark bill, was passed this spring, and the new regulations may now not be finalized until late 2020. Is this, is this lawsuit going to stop that? Well, what's interesting is, uh, as you set up perfectly, we're in this interesting limbo stage where a law gets passed, but we don't know how it's going to get implemented. And it turns out it's going to take a while to figure that out. So understandably, communities impacted by it are raising questions about why does it take so long? Why can't we have these? Should we have a moratorium? And this is all going to get settled, I think, in court. In court or in the legislature? I don't see the legislature taking this on again. I, I think the court battle on this will be very interesting. Colorado Rising hasn't exactly had a great track record of suing over some of these issues that they've tried, so it'll be interesting to see whether they can move this one forward. The uh, Colorado Oil and Gas Conservation Commission does admit that it's in something of a limbo land right now between trying to satisfy what 181 requires under the rules that were passed long before. Uh, and the environmental and the anti-fracking people want to see permitting stopped. And this bill, or this lawsuit that Rising filed, really only deals with one subdivision up in Broomfield, but their request is to stop all of it until these rules get done. And, and as you said, that's a year away from, that's a year away. So is, is this something with the, that the courts will have to resolve? Probably. David, quickly, do you think the courts it, will resolve it? Well, yeah, and it's the, the complaint which was written by uh, Joe Salazar, the former state legislator and defeated candidate for uh, in the primary for attorney general, uh, doesn't really help the, the courts with this. As I, the, in this period between when the 181 mm -hmm. became law and the time it's taking to write new complicated regulations, the uh, director of the Oil and Gas Commission has created these director's objective criteria which to, to give the commission guidance in, in how to approve things taking into account the, rule, the requirements of 181 but with before having the detailed regulations and what was missing in this complaint was a specific explanation of how that is unlawful uh, you know there's a lot of hand waving and, and you know stuff but in terms of the a, a judge who you know is just trying to like a, apply the law the complaint really doesn't give the judge much particular guidance on how the commission is supposedly acting illegally. John, really quickly. The, the, well, the fact that uh, Colorado is now being ranked as one of the top oil and gas producers in the nation uh, is a good thing. But I don't know that uh, I don't know that those. Uh, but for you know the safety reasons, I think should outweigh the rankings. Um, you know, we don't want to end up like uh, the plant down in Texas that blew up across the street from the school. So I, I, I say, if we don't have the safety regulations in there, I I I just I, I really wonder about the bill to begin with. Okay, and now the most fun of the week. <laughs> 
and quickly. Marianne, your disgrace. So much to choose from, but I'm going to go with the two gentlemen who were arrested at Dallas Airport this week, uh, business associates of Rudy Giuliani, who have now been charged with campaign finance violations for running $325,000 through a shell company. Um, these two gentlemen made a total of almost a million dollars in contributions to a variety of candidates and committees in the 2018 election. And some of that money routed through a House uh, GOP committee to our very own Mike Kaufman, who took $90,000. We, we don't know what he's going to do about that yet. David. The National Basketball Association, which is a running dog lackey of reactionary imperialists. <laughs> they have the same free speech rules as the Chinese dictatorship, which is you can, you can say anything you want critical of the United States, but don't breathe a word uh, against the Chinese tyrants. John. Is this good or bad? Bad. This is bad. Well, and fast. Uh, and fast. Uh, I'm going to say, uh, I'm gonna say the, uh, Hick that Hickenlooper and Hancock have not helped with equity, diversity, and equality in cannabis. Uh, those are words we haven't heard around Colorado. None of the, uh, uh, there are two owners in Denver Black, four in the whole state. Natasha. I could complain about the commute on Thursday with the snow. Uh, instead, I'll raise awareness of the fact that from RTD and, and down the line, there are lots of people looking for drivers right now, including CDOT, who is looking for snowplow drivers. Okay, and very fast, something nice. The Colorado Journalism Institute at Colorado College, which is focusing on local, teaching students how to write for local news. Uh, they are led by uh, Corey Hutchins, their full-time faculty member, who brought in a very bright young reporter from the Washington Post two weeks ago. Um, it, they're doing great work. David? So many freedom-loving Americans from all across the political spectrum uniting in support of the people of Hong Kong. John? Uh, Fifty-three years ago, the Black Panther Party was founded in 1966, and I think that was a very good year. And Natasha? The National Museum of Finland is returning items um, taken from Mesa Verde quite a bit, uh, quite a long time ago. An amazing story. That's all the time we have for Colorado Inside Out tonight. Thank you for everyone who watched. Dominic will be back tomorrow, uh, next week. And in the meantime, I'm Patty Calhoun, the editor of Westward, and probably next week I'll still be the editor of Westward. Thanks so much for watching. Also, one very last nice thing. Historic Denver just won a huge award from the National Trust, which has been in town during this very snowy week with its convention. So congratulations to them. Thanks for watching. Hey, that's good. That's a good one.